Okay, we're going to continue our study on justification. On the outline, we're on the second page, halfway down, under the heading that uh, no one is saved or stays saved by keeping the law, not even in Israel's program. Uh, last few weeks, we've made the point that we're justified by faith without the deeds of the law, and it doesn't matter what sins you commit before or after you're saved. You're saved not by what you do, but by what God did for you, by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's salvation is the gift of God. We're told in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and we're also told that in Romans 6, 23, that eternal life is the gift of God. So since it's a gift, there's nothing you can do to earn it, and there's nothing you can do to keep it. Now what I wanted to do, and we'll probably do this for two weeks, is to go over the tricky part to this, and I think this is where people get confused, is that if you look in the Old Testament, you look in Israel's program, uh, there appears to be the provisions that if Israel, at least in their program, if they did not keep the law, they did not keep the commandments, then they would lose their salvation. Um, that's Most people, I think, get that, and even if you don't rightly divide, what I think ends up happening is that people try to take the verses that are in Israel's program apply to us today. And they'll say, well, see, it says, do this and live. Or if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. And then they'll look at those verses and they'll say, well, this shows that it's not a free gift, that it's not something that you, where you just can do whatever you want and still have eternal life. They'll take verses from Israel's program and says, well, the Bible says you got to keep the commandments, you got to do the works, so you've got to maintain your salvation. And what I wanted to show you then is we're going to look at some of those passages. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show you is this point here that even under the law program, even under Israel's program, their salvation was not maintained by works of the law. It's not maintained by the law. And I put up here, you know, the idea that we are a three-part being. We're flesh, we're soul, and we're spirit. And that when we are, before we're saved, our flesh is alive and our spirit is dead. And we, we've gone over that. When we are saved, God makes our spirit alive. Problem is that our flesh is still alive too. Before, we didn't have a choice. Before you're saved, you have to sin. Even when you're doing good works, you're not doing it by having faith in God. And so you're sinning even in your good works. There's no way for you to have eternal life on your own merit. But once you're saved, your spirit becomes alive. And when the Holy Spirit works with your spirit, and He strengthens that soul, and you make your decisions based on the Word of God rightly divided, then you are living above sin. You are living by faith in God. The problem comes when the, the fact remains that the flesh is still there. Um, and we went over how the flesh is operated by Satan is the one who tries to use the flesh to get you to sin, whereas God uses the spirit within you in order for you to walk in the spirit or do the works of God, not sin. Now, in Israel's program, um, it's really the same idea. There are still those two systems in Israel's program. What's different, though, is because I, I talked about how you know Ephesians 1 says you are accepted in the Beloved. You're accepted in Christ. Colossians 3 says your life is hid in Christ. Romans 5 talks about when you're saved, you're taken from Adam and you're placed into Christ. So really, your salvation, your eternal life, your ability not to sin is all in Christ. And it's through the Holy Spirit working with your spirit that's alive that you walk in the Spirit and you don't sin. The same principles apply to Israel's program, but the problem is when you're in your Old Testament, you don't have that Spirit being alive. The problem is that they are under the law, they are still have the flesh there, the blood of Christ has not been shed yet. If the blood of Christ has not been shed yet, they haven't received the atonement. Look over in Acts chapter 3, and you can see that even after the cross, in Israel's program, they still have not received the atonement. For us today, Romans 5, we're told 
we have now. Once we trust in the blood of Christ as atonement for our salvation, as, as uh, forgiveness of our sins, we receive the atonement. We have eternal life right now. All of us today, if we've trusted in the blood of Christ to save us, we have eternal life right now. We're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. We are in Christ. All of those things have happened. But for Israel and their program, even after the cross, it's still future. In Acts 3, still in Israel's program, before, where are we? Before Paul here, we're over here in Acts 3, over here in Peter, in Israel's program, in Acts 3, verse 19, Peter tells Israel here in his sermon, he says, Acts 3, 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So it tells you right there that the time that their sins are blotted out is when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And verse 20 says those times of refreshing is when he shall send Jesus Christ. So that's the second coming. So in Israel's program, they don't receive the atonement until out here, second coming of Christ. So even though there's still this principle, I mean, we're still flesh, soul, and spirit, and God seeks to use you know, the, the spirit to control the soul, for Israel, that won't take place until the kingdom, when they're under the new covenant. They, since they don't have the atonement of sins yet, then they don't have the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're given the Holy Spirit as a, as a gift to speak in tongues and that type of thing in Acts 2. But as far as how the Holy Spirit operates today, indwelling us, sealing us till the day of redemption, um, teaching us the Word, those things, those things are absent from Israel's program because a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, cannot dwell in unholy man. And man is not holy until... He's forgiven of his sins, which in Israel's program isn't until the second coming of Christ. And so because all of that is working, what we have then, that's why we have over here in Israel's program, law, law, and it should be out here too, law out here. But under our program today, we have grace. Even though they've had faith in what God told them, they are still under the law. They are still supposed to keep the commandments. Us today, because we have the atonement, we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can teach us the things of God, then we can be put under that new system of grace right now. Whereas Israel will not be obeying that law and, and being under that program where the Spirit is controlling the soul until they get to the second coming of Christ. Uh, look over in Ezekiel, and we'll see this over here in Ezekiel 36. And we'll start in verse 24. Ezekiel 36 and 24. For I will take you from among the heathen. The heathen are the Gentiles. So if he's going to take them, he's talking about Israel. He's going to take Israel from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. That didn't happen back in 1950. That's going to happen here out here in the kingdom where God himself brings them into their own land. Verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. There's that water baptism that John the Baptist started. It's the idea of sprinkling them to be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. But you notice there all of this is future. You know, verse 25, then, then will I sprinkle 
will I cleanse you. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. Uh, verse 29, um, ye shall dwell in the land. Ye shall be my people. I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. Uh, so you can see there, this is all future. So when you're looking at the Old Testament and even when you're looking at the New Testament in Israel's program, because it's all future, the way that God works through them is a little different. Even though they have the same systems of flesh and spirit, really the spirit isn't able to control the soul in order to live for God in Israel's program until the time when the Holy Spirit is given to them when they're controlled by God, just like it is for us today. We're not, our spirit is dead before we're saved. When we're saved, the Holy Spirit's given unto us, we can walk in the spirit. Israel, they may be saved, and but they cannot be under grace yet. They have to be under the law because they're waiting for the atonement where they're cleansed before the Holy Spirit can indwell them and, and uh, cause them to walk in God's ways, just like we see in Ezekiel. But the point, and so that's why when we look at Old Testament or we look in the Hebrew epistles and we'll see this conditional salvation, we'll see them under the law. And what we need to recognize, it's a different system than what we have. That's the first thing. And, um, and so there, theirs is a future. But just because they're under the law doesn't mean they're saved by the law. Uh, look over in Galatians in chapter 2. And starting in verse 15. Galatians 2, starting in verse 15. Galatians 2, 15 says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So even though they're under the law program in Israel, it says... A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, uh, of course, he's talking doctrine for us today in, this, in the grace dispensation, but he does make that statement at the end of verse 16, that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified be justified. That's even in Israel's program. And the thing is simple, we've looked at it before in Romans 7, is that in my flesh dwells no good thing, and the law is actually makes sin exceedingly sinful. So there's really no capacity. If I don't have the Holy Spirit and guided me, then I'm not under, if I'm not under God's control in that program, in my own flesh, I can't obey the law. So even though Israel is given the law and they're under that system, they can't fulfill it perfectly. Nobody can because they don't have the Holy Spirit with them. That's not going to take place until that kingdom. So without the Holy Spirit to guide them and cause them to walk in, the, in that law, then they can't obey the law. And if God says you have to be justified by the works of the law, then none of them are going to be in that kingdom. So even though God puts them under the law, the justification is a different method. And it's really the same for us as it was for them. Look over in Hebrews and chapter 11. The book of Hebrews, written to the Hebrews, written to Israel. It's part of their program here, the prophecy program. In that program, he does not tell them, if you obey the law, you'll maintain your salvation. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So even in Israel's program we're told 
that the only way to please God is faith. You have to have faith. So the, the point is that even though in the Old Testament there are all these passages about the law, really what that has to do with is a lot like you would do with your children. Uh, you give your children certain rules, certain laws to follow. A curfew at night, or you've got to do your homework before you can play, or, or whatever the rules are, you establish these rules. Um, they are under the law. Those, those laws or those rules are set in place to teach them something, teach them how to learn structure, follow certain rules, so that when they get out on their own, they'll be doing okay. If they disobey those rules, you don't say, well, you're out of the house. I'm, you're not my child anymore. I'm never going to see you again. You know, you, you're out of here. What you should do, then it's really, it's just there. You give them a punishment and to correct them so they will follow the law. And that's really what God is doing. God calls Israel the children of Israel over 600 times just in Exodus through Deuteronomy alone. They are considered children. So what you do with children is you give them laws structure to follow. If they don't follow those laws, they're, it's not that they're not your child anymore. What determines who is a part of the children of Israel are those who have faith. They are children by faith. And that, that's a whole topic to go through. Uh, but rather than do that, I wanted to show you an example of this. And we're going to look at Saul and we're going to look at David. Um, look at look over in 2 Samuel chapter 11. David was considered a man after God's own heart. But he was under the law. He did not obey the law perfectly. I've mentioned, last week I mentioned, you know, if you do some of the big sins, a lot of times people will say, you know, if you lie or you do certain things, it doesn't show you aren't saved. But if I was to murder someone or commit adultery or, you know, one of those big sins, people say, well, that person was never saved in the first place. They don't have eternal life. Or maybe they were saved, but they lost their salvation. That's what most people would say. They make a differentiation between little sins and big sins. And if you're part of the big sins, then you're not saved. You lost your salvation or you never had it. That's what most people say. Even under the law program, though, we find that that's not true. You look at 2 Samuel 11 and verse 3. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Uh, so there, David commits adultery. According to the law of Moses, committing adultery was punishable by death. So, but we'll continue here. Verse 15. 2 Samuel 11, verse 15. And he wrote, that's David, David wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, and Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. So David really gives the command in verse 15, basically, so that Uriah may be killed. So David commits adultery with Bathsheba. Uriah is Bathsheba's husband. And to cover his sin of adultery then, he commits murder. He, com he makes the commandment that causes Uriah to die. Committing murder is also a punishment. Uh, the punishment under the law is also death. So if we judge David by the law, we've already seen two instances. He's got two counts of of the death penalty against him basically. He's committed adultery which is punishable by death. He's committed murder which is also punishable by death. Two things there. Uh, then in, in First Chronicles, you don't need to go there, but in First Chronicles 21, 1 through 4, 
Uh, he also disobeyed the commandment by numbering the people, and that was against God's commandment. So we've seen him do, if we're going to judge David by the law, he's done two things that the law says you should be killed. You're worthy of death. Now look in Romans chapter 4, and we'll see what God did with him. I mean, God knows what David did. David was his king. God set David upon the throne. He picked him from the sons of Jesse, told Samuel, anoint David as king. And, and so um, let's see what God does. Romans chapter 4 and verse 6. We get the example of David. Romans 4 verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So you're filling the blank is that David committed adultery, murder, and numbered the people, and God did not hold him guilty or take the kingdom away from him. Go over to 2 Samuel chapter 7. So David is under the law, and the law says in two different instances that David is worthy of death, that he should be killed. But yet we see from Romans 4 that God did not impute his sin to him. He covered his iniquity. He forgave him of his sin, even though he's under the law, and he's committed sins that under the law are worthy of death. God says his sins are forgiven him. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verse 15. 2 Samuel 7 verse 15. God is talking to David here. He's really talking to Nathan, but Nathan's going to give the, the prophecy is for David. And he says, But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be, shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So God says to David, verse 16, Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Verse 15, he says that by contrast with Saul, God took the kingdom away from Saul. So let's see what Saul did that was so bad. We've already seen what David did. David committed adultery and he murdered. Both sins punishable by death. Both sins that if I'm a, a Christian today in most churches, if I've committed adultery and then I murdered the guy's, uh, the, the woman's uh, wa uh, husband, most churches would say, I am not saved. I've lost my salvation or I never had it. In order for me to murder and to commit adultery after I've been saved, then I must have lost it. I, must, I wasn't walking by the spirits I, or I didn't have it. In other words, most churches would say, I'm not saved because I've done these sins. But God says, even under the law, not under grace. Under grace, most people say, you don't have your salvation. But God, under the law, says, David does have his salvation. His sins are forgiven him. I've established his kingdom forever. But let's see how he treated Saul. Saul, he took it away from, from him. Um, look in 1 Samuel in chapter 13. So God established Saul as the king of Israel. And then Saul does something and God takes his kingdom away. And let's look at what he did here. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13 starting in verse 8. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 8. Remember, we're under the law. These are the passages, in, well, not these passages, but people will use passages from the Old Testament to try to say you can lose your salvation or you have to keep the law. 
1 Samuel 13, verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Um, the context, what had happened is that God had commanded for Saul to wait until Samuel arrives. And once Samuel arrives, then the burnt offering could be made. Saul got a little impatient and said, well, I've been waiting seven days for Samuel to show up. He's not shown up. I'll just go ahead and offer the burnt offering. And so then Samuel says, verse 13, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. That's David. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So, now think about this for a minute. God gives the commandment to Samuel, or I'm sorry, to Saul. He gives the commandment to Saul and says, wait till Samuel shows up, then offer the burnt offering. Saul waits a good seven days, and he says, well, I guess Samuel's not showing up. I'll go ahead and offer the burnt offering. He offers a burnt offering, which is to the Lord. He makes an offering to the Lord. He's not sacrificing to devils or idols or anything. It's an offering to the Lord that he makes. And he offers that, and God says, You disobeyed my commandment. I'm taking the kingdom away from you. <coughs> but David committed adultery, and he committed murder. And God says, I'm forgiving you of your sins. Does that, I mean, what, what do you think? If, you, if you're a judge, and someone comes before you, and they offered a sacrifice to God, they just didn't wait for Samuel... There's no commandment under the law says, oh, that person is to be killed. That person isn't going to have the kingdom anymore. There's nothing like that under the law. The law says you murder, you die. You commit adultery, you die. It seems like in these cases that God is being unfair. You know, all Saul did was offer a burnt offering to God. He just did it at the wrong time. <coughs> all of a sudden, his kingdom's taken away. But David, he murdered he committed adultery. He did the big sins that were worthy of death under the law. And God says, I'm forgiven, David, of his sins. Why is it like that? The reason is the same as what we've been talking about for us today in the dispensation of grace. It's faith versus works. Trying to work his way. Saul was trying to work his way to heaven. He did not have faith in God to save him. He did not have faith faith in God's imputed righteousness to enter the kingdom. Saul was trying to do it on his own. So there's a different standard that God judges by if you're self-righteous as opposed to the standard of faith. Look over in Romans chapter 2. So it all depends on what you're under. If you decide, I'm going to be righteous on my own, I'm going to work my way to heaven, then Romans 2 and verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 6, we'll start in verse 6, is how God will judge you. He says, okay, you're self-righteous on your own, you're going to make it have eternal life by your own deeds, so that means I'm going to judge you by your own deeds. Romans 2 verse 6 who will render to every 